You know, as I was, you know, this week, I think, you know, we were praying about it, but I think this week was a heavy week for a lot of us. You know, what I'm feeling as I walk into this room and I, I'm seeing all of us, I feel that there's this heaviness going on. There's a lot happening. I think a lot of us, we've experienced loss. We've experienced, we're experiencing grief. We're, we're, we're looking at the news and it's causing anxiety and we're, we're struggling. And this is just what I'm perceiving in this space. And maybe that's not you, and that's awesome. But I think for a lot of us, there is something we're feeling. You know, and, and we've been going through this, this series called I Am. And, you know, when we, when we were going through this, when I, when I was praying about, you know, what series to do for the summer, I didn't know what was going to be happening in our world. I, to be honest, when we planned this, I didn't even know if we were going to have restriction, or I had no clue what it was going to look like, or I had no clue. But the timing of this series, I think, has been perfect. Because for all of us, I think it's a reminder of who Jesus is. Because I think sometimes we lose track of it. I think sometimes we, we forget. We forget about what he's done in our life sometimes. Right? We, we sometimes forget about the miracles because all we're seeing is the pain in front of us. And so we get sidetracked. And I think for all of us, for, at least for me, I'm speaking specifically for me, this has been amazing for me because I'm shifting my focus from the pain I'm seeing and just looking at my Savior. I'm shifting my focus from my circumstance saying, you know what, yes, it is hard. Like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this, this past while has been easy because it, it has not been easy for any of us. We've all experienced something different. There's something going on for all of us. There's been something that we've lost. And it's not been easy. But I want to encourage you that 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 you know, as we, we're going to conclude this series today, but I want to encourage you, above everything else, let's shift our focus from our circumstance, from our pain, to our Savior, to our Creator, to the one who, who's penning our story. Let's shift our focus, because what we focus on, that's what we pursue. And if we're pursuing the pain, that's where we're going to go. And of course, we have to deal with our pain. We have to deal with it. But don't do it by yourself. Don't walk through the emotion that you're feeling, the loss, the grief, the anxiety that you're feeling. Don't walk through that by yourself. Allow Jesus in. Allow him to be a part of it. Allow him into that moment with you. It is vulnerable. It is hard, but it is so important. It is so, so, so important. So I want to encourage all of us, let's shift our focus from our circumstance, from our fear, from our anxiety to Jesus. Because he will be there for you. And you know, this past week, Beth and I, we watched this movie. It's a Pixar movie from 2001. And it's called Monsters, Inc. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this movie, Monsters, Inc. It's like a Pixar classic. Like, some of you in this room, you weren't even born when that movie came out. 2001. Uh, but it's, it's this movie where it's about these monsters who they have to collect energy um, uh, and so that they can power their city. And the way they do this is that they have these doors that come into this warehouse and they walk into a room and they get it from the screams of children, right? So it's like this crazy, crazy story. Great news at the very end of the movie. I'm going to spoil it for you. They actually realize that laughter's better. And so that's amazing. So it's no longer screams, it's laughter. But anyway, there's this movie and there's, these, there's this warehouse that doors come down and the monsters enter through these doors and they enter into any place in the world. There's th thousands and thousands, millions and millions and millions of these doors. And then they meet this young child who actually comes into kind of the monster world and they meet this young child and they try and get her home, right? They're trying to get her back home, but there's only one door that can get her home. And so throughout the movie, they're trying to find this door so they can get this girl back home to her family, to her house. And they're looking for it, and they can't find it. And it's this whole, whole, whole thing. And finally, they find it, and, and they get her home, and they get her through the door. And there was only one door that could get her back home. There was only one door. And this, this similar to this I am statement that Jesus makes next. This I am statement that he makes next. Uh, next is very similar to this movie to the story and it's John 10 verse 10 and I'm going to be reading 10 verses for us today so just stay with me so John 10 verse 1 says this truly truly I say to you he who enters who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way that man is a thief and a robber right if somebody is climbing uh into your house through the window 
That's either your child who's sneaking back in or it's a robber and a thief, right? Like, I don't go home and think, you know how I'm going to get in my house through the window, right? Unless the door's locked. But, like, this is what he's saying. Anyone who tries to enter through the sheepfold, anyone who tries to enter the pasture, not by the door, is a thief and a robber. But number two, uh, verse two, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This fi figure of speech Jesus used with them, they did not understand, right? Again, the disciples, if you read through the, the, the Bible, there's so many moments where Jesus says something, and they're like, hold up. I have zero clue what you're talking about. Can you explain this, like, in a language we understand, right? And this is what they say. They're like, what are you trying to say? So Jesus is like, okay. Verse 7. So Jesus sa again said to them, Jesus had to repeat himself a lot. Maybe like us as parents, we have to repeat ourselves a lot to our kids so they fully grasp it. Sometimes it takes 10, 15 for 40 years for them to fully grasp what we're trying to say so he says this truly truly i say to you i am the door of the sheep all who came before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep did not listen to them he, verse 9 i am the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and will go out and find pasture first uh john 10 10 a verse that's super famous the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the door of the sheep. There are many doors, right, in our world. There are many doors that we can go through. There are many choices that we can make, decisions we make, places we go that are not actually where we're supposed to go. You know, he says, I am the door of the sheep because the, the door that we choose determines everything. The door that we open and we walk through changes everything. Those decisions that we make change everything, but there's only one door that will lead you to everlasting life. There's only one door that will lead you to freedom. There's only one door that will lead us to where we need to be. And there are so many doors that sometimes we pursue. Sometimes we do this subconsciously, right? I don't think a lot of us, we pursue these doors and we open them consciously, but sometimes we pursue them subconsciously. One of us, some of us, we, we pursue the door of comfort, right? We want to be comfortable. And I think comfortable, I think we've been tricked to think that comfort is what we need to do. So I'm telling you, Jesus, when he was walking on this earth and he was dying on the cross, he was not comfortable. But he was where he was supposed to be. So if we open the door, we choose comfort. Or some of us, we open the door of convenience, right? This is just the fastest way to get there. This is the door that, that is the biggest door. It's the easiest to bring all my stuff into. It's just the biggest door. So we choose the door of convenience. Or this door looks easy. This is the easy way through this moment. So I'm just going to choose the easy path. I'm going to open the easy door. Some of us, it's the door of conformity. We just conform to whatever, we're, whatever people tell us we're supposed to do. And that's what we conform to. And that's the door we open. But today I have three doors that I specifically want to talk about. That I think a lot of us, we might be walking through and entering into. Number one is the door of fame. You know, I think all of us, we have this desire to be noticed. We have this desire for people to actually know us. We have this desire for people to like us. We have this desire for, for people to want to have us around. We have this desire for people to know who we are. We all want the pleasure that being noticed can bring. We want the pleasure that being noticed can be, can be. And if we're striving for fame rather than freedom, we will be left with nothing. Because nothing gets us to heaven except for Jesus. The only thing that's actually going to get you to, to the everlasting life that you're looking for, the only thing that's going to bring you joy and full peace and, 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 and all that is Jesus. He is the only door that will bring you that. All doors lead somewhere because the door to fame doesn't lead you to the pasture because it leads you to pleasure. Some of us, we're, we're, it says that you know, the door opens and they enter into the pasture. Some of us, we're, we're so focused on pleasure that we don't, we don't even want the pasture. 
We think, okay, if I can only do this, that's going to bring me the pleasure that I need. It's going to actually help me cope with, with everything going on. And I'm going to be able to get through it. So we're looking for pleasure rather than the pasture. Pleasure lasts for seconds, maybe minutes, but the pasture lasts forever. If you want true freedom, if you want true joy, if you want true peace, you're not going to find it in pleasure. You're not going to find it in the things that bring you pleasure for a moment. It might help for a little bit, but eventually it's going to leave you empty and broken. You're going to find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death rather than in the pasture. Because the valley takes a while to get there, but once, you, once you're there, it's hard to get out. And we, so we pursue pleasure rather than the pasture because pleasure will always make us feel shame. If we're pursuing fame, we're going to feel shame. And that's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to feel shame. He doesn't want you to feel free. He doesn't want you to experience Christ. He doesn't want you to experience it. He came to steal, kill, and destroy your life. But Jesus said, I came to give you life and give it abundantly. And, and you might not feel it right now, but guess where you, I'm taking you is so much better than where you are now. The, the pasture that, that, that is in front of you is so much better. You have to enter through me. I am the door you're looking for. Because the, the pasture is lovely. The pasture is streams and has plants, it has fruit, it has chirping birds. It's like a Disney movie when the princess is walking through the field and the birds are chirping and the stream is going. It's beautiful, it's perfect. It's the best place we can go. Because that's where God leads us. And there's a psalm, Psalm 23. I think a lot of us have probably heard portions of this before, but it says this. Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He'll lead you to rest in the pasture. Makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And when we, when we look at this, this is the pasture, right? This, this is where God is leading us to rest. He says, we, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Like this is what, this is not where fame will lead you. This is not where, ple where pleasure will lead you. It will not lead you to the house of the Lord forever. It will lead you everywhere else except for the one door that is supposed to take you there. Because fame leads to shame and Jesus leads you to grace. Yeah, we make mistakes. Yeah, we sometimes pursue the wrong thing. Sometimes we're peeking indoors, but Jesus is saying, no, pursue me and I will show you the grace that you desperately, desperately need. I will show you the, the peace that you need. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I think when we look at, again, this world that we're living in, this past two years, some of us, we feel like we're continuously walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I think some of us, we've been in the valley for so long that we feel like we're alone in the valley. No, what we thought was going to lead us to a better career, what we thought was going to lead us to finding our spouse, or what we thought was going to lead us to a great relationship, actually led us in the opposite direction. And we find ourselves sitting in this valley and we feel like we're alone. But I'm telling you, I, I love this because verse 4, again, so famous, but I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. You know, we may have led ourselves down there. We may be leading ourselves and opening the wrong doors and peeking through the wrong doors. We might be pursuing the wrong things. We might be finding pleasure instead of the pasture. And we feel like, oh, no, I, I can never make it back. Jesus is saying, no, I'm still with you. I'm following you. He said, I'm the door of the sheep. And guess what? The door follows you where you go. 
We feel like we have to make this long trek back and Jesus is saying, no, I'm still there. All you have to do is open the door and walk through me and then you will find the pasture. Then you will find peace. Then you will find the joy that you need. That's where you will find it when you open the door and that I am the door that will lead you into the pasture. Door to fame. Number two is the door to fear. We can't let fear be the door we enter. But, but it's so easy for us if fear is the emotion we pursue. I think a lot of us, and I think we're seeing this more and more, is people are pursuing fear so much. And we see this when we drive, when we go to the mall, when, wherever we go, we see people who are pursuing so much fear. And what happens is, is when we pr- pr- pursue fear, anxiety starts to grow. And right now, our world, anxiety is killing people. In our world right now, you know, the mental health of humanity right now is the lowest I have ever seen. I'm seeing people, uh, you know, in Los Angeles at the peak of COVID, the suicide hotline went up 400%. You know, we're seeing anxiety as a pandemic. It's killing people. And, like, it's hard. Because the thing about anxiety is that we can't see it oftentimes as observers. Right? We can't see into people's soul. We can't see into people. But so many people have so much turmoil on the inside that they don't even know where to go. You know, because we watch the news and we find out new ways that we can be afraid. We go on Facebook and we learn of new things that we need to be nervous about. We need, we're learning about people that we need to be nervous about. We're looking at our world and we're seeing it fall apart. And, and there's so much fear that can well up inside of us. Because being afraid causes anxiety and anxiety can take your life. Because you you know, the information we pursue will eventually control us, right? So if we're going and we do this, and I, I don't really know why we do this, but we often pursue the information that we want to have, right? So we'll search on Google what we want to learn about, and oftentimes we're searching for the wrong thing. Because if all we're searching for is fear, we're going to find fear, right? But if what we're searching for is hope, that's what we're going to find, And so I think our world right now, we're pursuing fear so much. We're opening the door to fear in our life rather than saying, Jesus, Jesus, I need you as the hope of this world. He says, I am the hope of the world. And guess what? We are carriers of that hope, but a lot of us were so scared to actually share that hope. We're so scared to say, you know what? I have the greatest gift. I have the greatest news that the world has ever seen. But so many of us were so scared to share it. We are. Because we don't know how people are going to respond. We don't know what social media is going to say. We don't know what the government is going to say. We don't know what our friends are going to say, what our family is going to say. So we just sit back and let other people do what we were created to do, which is share the gospel. Fear controls us, I think, more than we really realize, to be honest. Because we don't think about it. We, You know, when, when I introduce myself to people, I'm like, you know what? I'm actually really afraid. I'm, a, I'm afraid of sharing the gospel with people. That's not my first response when people ask who I am, right? I usually share all the grand things. I don't usually share the weakness. But I think, I think as believers, we need to get better at sharing our weaknesses with each other. We need to get better at sharing, you know what, I'm actually not okay right now. We need to get better at sharing, you know what, I need support. I actually need help. And we don't want to feel like we need help. Because we are so scared of how people are going to respond because we find our security in the wrong things. If we find our security in the government, if we find our security in our friendships, 
If we find our security in our family, if we find our security even in our church, if we find our security in our job or our profession or our money or our health, it will fail you. You know, as a pastor, as your pastor, there will be a time where I fail you. Like that, like that, like I am not a perfect human. There's going to be a moment where I fail you. And if your hope is found in me, that's a problem. If your security is found in me, if your security is found in anything other than the door of Jesus, you will find failure. Because I, we will fail each other. We are going to do that. And if, if our security is found in that, that's going to leave us devastated. Because God will never fail you. Our God never fails. But do we believe that? Like we see it, right? We love to talk about it. We read the scripture like, God, you never fail me. And then we find ourselves in a circumstance where we say, God, why did you fail me? And we pray, we say, God, this is the miracle that I need. And he's like, no, that's the miracle that you want. I, I, the miracle that you need is so much different and bigger and better. Why are you thinking about things so small? I have something so big for you, John 1, 48. I love this, uh, John 1, 4, verse 18. First John 4, verse 18 is what it says. There's no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. It doesn't just like slowly push it away. It says, get out of here, fear. Because perfect love casts out fear. And if we want to see fear go away, pursue love. And, and not just an earthly love, but a heavenly love. The Father that comes and says, I love you. I have so much more for you. I have peace for you, for joy for you. Fear will disappear. Our world is so afraid. And what that means is that our, our world needs love. Our world needs love. Our world needs Jesus. Because fear, uh, ver, uh, verse 18, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Fear can't exist in perfect love because it actually casts out fear. But sometimes fear is where we're comfortable. You know, there's this, there's this phenomena that happened. It's called Stockholm Syndrome. Maybe you've heard of Stockholm Syndrome before, but I'll read the definition and I'll tell you the story. But Stockholm Syndrome is defined as feelings of trust or affection felt in many cases of kidnapping or hostage taking by a victim toward a captor. So it's to do with somebody who's been taken captive starts to feel affection towards their captor. And there's this story, it comes from this bank robbery that went wrong in Stockholm, Sweden. This, this guy, he went and robbed a bank and he got caught. And so he was actually in this vault with these people for over 130 hours. And what they noticed is that this strange bond formed between the captor and the uh, people that he took captive, hostages, yes. Even at the end, they, they even tried to protect their, their captor when he, they, the police came and tried to take him away. They even said, hey, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see each other again. And it's because they felt kindness towards this guy. So this guy would actually tie a rope to them and let them walk out of the vault. And they felt that that was amazing and so kind of him. Right? And so people who are captive oftentimes grow affection towards their captor. And it's this phenomenon that they saw. And so some of us were so captive by fear that we start actually enjoying it. We actually are so afraid, but that's where we're the most comfortable. You know, the thieves and the robbers, that's who we get along better with than Jesus. Because the enemy is trying to trick you. He's trying to tell you that the life he's going to give you is better. But he's trying to kill you. He's trying to take your life. He's trying to destroy you. He wants you to be afraid. He wants you to be comfortable in fear. Some of us have started to trust the thieves and the robbers. They are, they, even though it's causing us so much pain, that's where we are the most comfortable. We, we don't want to choose Jesus because choosing Jesus isn't always easy. Because when we choose Jesus, we'll have to let go of things. We'll have to let go of habits and addiction and people sometimes. And that's not easy. We talked about it last week about the pruning that, that, you know, the Father comes and he prunes us. And it's not easy for us to be pruned, right? There's things in our life that we still want. 
And God's saying, no, you can't have that anymore because I have something different for you, something bigger for you. Are you letting fear, con fear control you or are you fighting fear with courage? Are you letting fear control you? And I can't, I can't speak that to you. I can't say that you are, but that is a question I think we all need to think about. Are we letting fear control us? Fear of the future, fear of our world, fear of people. Are we letting that control us? We need to talk to Jesus and let him know that we're afraid. And I believe that he will give you and he will give me the courage that I need to get through the fear that I experience. Number three, the door to freedom. Now this is the door. This is the door to the pasture. This is the door to heaven. This is the door to everlasting life. The door to the future. The door that will bring you true security. The door that will actually bring you to where you need to go. Our security is found in the one writing the story. We, we, we actually have conversation with the narrator of our story who's, who's walking us through every moment. We actually get to talk to him and that's the door of freedom. The one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who created the mountains and who created this world that we live in. We actually have direct dialogue with him. The one who created everything. Our hope is not found here on earth, it is found in Jesus. That's where our hope needs to be found in 2 Corinthians 3.17 says this. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Now this is a verse that I think we love, right? I love this verse. Now, this, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We sing about it, we talk about it, but are you allowing that freedom to actually impact you? The, the freedom's present, right? Like, that's no question. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But are we actually allowing that freedom to impact us? Are we actually walking into that freedom? Are we actually walking into the future? Are we actually letting the Spirit bring us the freedom we need? Are we letting Him do that? Because the freedom's present. Some of us were praying for freedom, which is awesome. But He say, hey, I'm already there. I'm already present. Are you listening when God is speaking? Because if we go back to that, that, that very first verse... Verse 3, John 10 verse 3 says this, To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He knows your name. Right? He, he knows your story. He knows your future. He's saying, I'm present. Like, the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And when we give our lives to Jesus, Spirit, is present and so we're looking for freedom and Jesus is saying I'm calling you by name but are you actually listening or is is the voice of the father a strange voice to you is the voice of the father one that that, that you've never heard before he's calling you by name Verse 4, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. Do you know the voice of the Father when he's speaking to you? Have you actually experienced the freedom that he's talking about? Because he's speaking right now. But we need to create space to listen. We need to create space to hear what he's saying. The Spirit brings freedom if we let him. Some of us, we hold on so tightly to the past that it's actually holding us captive. We can't experience freedom because the past is actually taking control of us. We aren't letting go of the past and we aren't stepping into our future. And so what happens is we get stuck in the place between where we were and where we're supposed to be. And we're stuck there. And some of us, we stay stuck there for so long because we can't let go. We want freedom, but we're stuck in bondage bondage to our past or our sin or to our addiction but God wants to bring you freedom if we truly want freedom we you have to choose Jesus we can't hold on to our past life we can't hold on to to the things we used to do we can't hold on to to, to the friends we used to have 
We can't hold on to the things that are, that, that, that are controlling us. Whatever that might be for you, we can't hold on to it. You know, as soon as we go through that door, we leave everything in the past. Because we're starting a new life. We're starting and saying, you know what? God's going to make me a new creation. So I'm stepping into the future. I'm stepping in. I'm leaving everything in the past because God is going to bring me better life than I've ever experienced before. You say, you know, we've been talking about this. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus always says, I am life for you. I am life for you. That's who I am. But if we don't choose Jesus, what we're actually doing is we're choosing death. We're choosing death. We have to choose Jesus. You know, our, our, our takeaway today, we've been doing this this whole series, is this, is that the door we choose determines everything. Choose the door of freedom. That's the door we got to choose. Because there's so many doors, right? There's so many. And the door we choose determines a lot for us. You know, don't let fear control you. Don't try and pursue pleasure. Don't try and pursue fame. Because if we do that, we're going to be left broken. We're going to be left lost. We're going to be left in shambles. We don't know where to go. And again, after this week we've been experiencing, there's just so much. I think right now there's so much to be afraid of, I'll be honest. Right? There's so many things that we can see on the news or that we can see on our phone or we can see from our friends that, that it's so easy to be afraid right now. But you know what's hard right now? Is being free. It's hard right now to, for some of us to have a relationship with Jesus. It's hard. Because right now it's easier because everyone else is afraid. We can just conform to being afraid. But he's just saying, man, I didn't create you for fear. I created you for freedom. You know, when they walked in the garden, there's free. You know, there's freedom and vulnerability and perfection. And then sin came in and Led people, leads us the wrong direction and we need to pursue Jesus with everything we have and so I just want to encourage you you know as we go into this next chapter as a church as we go into this next uh, moment as a nation as a whatever it is you know we have elections coming up there's a lot of change coming there's a lot of things happening and as we go into it I want to encourage you that no matter what happens no matter what, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Even if what you want to have happen in our nation doesn't happen, do not be afraid. Even if things get crazier and crazier and crazier, we don't have to be afraid. Why? Because we know where we're going. That no matter what, and we're hearing stories right now out of Afghanistan of these believers who have house church and they're preparing to die. Just so you know. There's stories coming out and videos coming out of believers and pastors in Afghanistan preparing for their death. And a lot of the ones I've seen, they're not afraid. Why? Do you know why? <laughs> it's because they know where they're going. And, and I, I think this is, as I look at them, I look at them and I say, I look at them and I think, man, well done, my good and faithful servant. Right? That's what I think. That's what I see. Because I see people who have dedicated their lives for 20 years bringing Jesus to a nation that desperately needs Jesus. And they're getting close maybe to the end and they're saying, they're praising God in this moment. I want to encourage you, no matter what, no matter what happens, let's not be afraid. Let's not be afraid. Because it's so easy to be afraid. But no matter what, let's not be afraid and let's share Jesus with our city. Let's share Jesus with our friends, with our family. And you know what? When we do that, there's going to be people who hate us. That's a promise in the Bible. <laughs> they will hate you. We cannot let people, how they think of us, what they think of us, control how we go. You know, I want us and me and 
our church, I want us to be a church that's known for how we love people. I want to be known as, as, a, as a pastor, as a Christian, as a believer, as a husband, as a father who loves deeply. That's what I want to be known for. You know, I don't want to be known for my accolades. I don't want to be known for what I've done. I, don't, I want to be known for how I love. And I think that's, our, that's my prayer for us, is that we'll be known for how we love each other. Not how divided we are. Not what our opinions are. Because we all have opinions, right? We all think we're right. We do. We really do. We all think we're right. But don't let that break relationship. Because we're going to be entering into a season as a church, as a country, as a city, as a province that's going to be tr trying to divide us. It's going to happen. That is, that's already happening. There's so much division. And just because we disagree does not mean that we can't have relationship. Does not mean that we can't love each other. Let us be known as a church that loves. That people come in, they think different, they dress different, they act different. We love people. That's who we are that's what I want us to be. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And right now the Spirit is in this place. So freedom is present. Freedom from sin. Freedom from addiction. Freedom from trauma. Freedom from anxiety. Is in this room. If we allow that freedom to actually do what it's supposed to do. You know, again, I... I, I am feeling a lot of heaviness right now in, in our city. And, you know, we you go downtown and I'm just seeing so many people struggling. There's so many people who are hurting and broken. And there's so much heaviness and we're seeing so much grief. And, and I think, like, it's, it's okay for us to experience that. But I want to encourage you, let us love people. I'm just going to pray for us. I know that, that, you know, God has something for us in this next season as a church, as a city. And, and our, our prayer is that it'll be love. So, Father, I thank you for this church. God, I thank you for almost 30 years of Victory Church on the Rock. God, we thank you for the past 30 years and what you've done, the miracles, the salvations, the baptisms, the marriages, the healings, the miracles. For the lives that have been changed and the lives that have been healed and the relationships that have been healed. And God, we just are so grateful for what you've done. But God, as we step into the next 30 years, God, I pray for more. God, we pray for, for us to open the door of life. God, we pray that, that even as individuals, we will open that door. We will not be afraid. God, we are not afraid of the future. We are not afraid of what's coming. We are not afraid. We stand together and we stand in courage and we know that we're fighting the good fight. God, I pray that as we do this, God, I pray that you lead us into what you have for us. God, I pray that we will be a church that's known for how we love people, not how we hate people. God, I pray for each individual in this place, each individual who's watching online. God, I pray for freedom to come and meet them wherever they are. God, I pray for chains that have been holding people captive for year after year after year will be broken right now in Jesus' name. Pray for addictions that people have been struggling with for years and years and years and years to be broken in Jesus' name. I pray for marriages that have been broken. God, I pray for healing right now in Jesus' name. God, I pray for parents who have kids who they, don't, they, they, they can't talk to. There's so much broken relationship. God, I pray for healing in Jesus' name. God, I pray for our friends who are so afraid right now. Scared of what's coming. Scared of the future. Scared of what's happening. God, I pray for that to break in Jesus' name. God, I pray for your freedom to come. For your peace to come. For your grace to come in Jesus' name. And God, I pray that we will pursue the pasture. We will not pursue pleasure. God, I thank you that you are so much more for us. And God, I pray that as we go into what's next, God, I pray that you lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage everyone to stand with us.